I'm Dr. Michael Latola, And I'm Megan Strong. In our case of the week, we're going to take a look at what happens when dentists prescribe one material and then don't give us the right margin. And attention multitaskers, time to get your teeth brushed and take a nap in Tokyo. And in viewer mail, a dentist writes in and wants to know why in the last issue of Chairside Magazine, I complained about the aesthetics of the average crown in the front of the magazine, and then I used something that probably wasn't the most aesthetic restoration in the photo essay and wants to know why. Why? Watch to find out. That and more on today's Chairside Live. Hey now, hello and welcome to episode 128 of Chairside Live. 128, 128 megabytes, which is nothing today. That's like right? a photo that you sent. That was as big as my computer hard drive was in 1982. The year 1982, you were born. I was mm -hmm. not born in you 1982. Okay. All right. 1987, but all right, close it's all right. Mm -hmm. I, I knew I was going to go five years one way or the other. You were in the same decade. That's okay. How uh, how you doing? Good. I started um, a new intense workout program. Mm -hmm. It's insane, if you will. It's insanity mm -hmm. by uh, Sean T. Oh. He reminds you to keep your core tight and to re drink, drink your recovery formula, which is hilarious because he's got this funny way of encouraging you throughout the workout. Um, but I'm on day three. Is it working? I'm day three, okay. so we'll see. But we'll I see. can barely walk, so yes. All right, so, all right. We'll, give, we'll get progressive updates yeah. over the next few weeks from you. Sure. And I'm going to keep my core tight as you. There you go. So he won't yell at me. Mm -hmm. There we go. Now we're going to try to talk. <clears throat> well, we got a great case of the week for you this week. At least I think so. In fact, we're going to take a look at what happens when a dentist prepares a tooth or teeth for a certain material and then we just don't have enough at the margin to be able to go with that material. In fact, let's take a look at that now. For this week's case of the week, I wanted to share something with you that's uh, been, it's come up a lot in the laboratory um, for the last, I don't know, four years probably, but it just happened a couple times this week where cases were brought to me by technicians. So I thought, well, let's talk about this a little bit. And it has to do with um, uh, minimum reduction and it's it seems like something we harp on a lot but it's something we run into daily in fact we had a record number of phone calls to doctors from the laboratory last month and this is what uh, a lot of them are is having to switch products for doctors so for example this is uh, the doctor prescribed three Emax crowns this is opposing a full denture a pretty worn full denture and so uh, issue number one is um, the amount of reduction that we have here is certainly not the millimeter that we need for Emacs. And so we want to switch uh, the doctor to, to, to Bruxer and um, the doctor is okay with it for the back one, but still went on Emacs on the first two preps where there is enough occlusal reduction. And you could argue, well, just make an Emacs here and then spot the opposing on the denture too. But a doctor feels there's enough wear on the denture and doesn't want to do that. But when we look a little closer at those three preps without the bite being part of it, again, we see kind of feather edge margins here. And uh, as we look around and look down, uh, good job of avoiding undercuts on that molar. How about on that bicuspid? Let's see if we can see everything. Looks like uh, on the scan, could be a little undercut right here in the middle third is when we tilt that to be able to see that middle third, we lose it on the buckle a little bit. And maybe a little bulky, uh, still here on the lingual. Um, so again, difficult to use Emacs there because of that, but really what I wanted to point out is just the margins. You know, the, the feather edge, very thin margins make it difficult, uh, if not impossible, and it is impossible to do Emacs. Certainly it'd be very difficult to mill Emacs. We could press it but we'd have to overbuild it and if we and it gets very thick and you have a bad emergence profile. And so this is something that we uh, frequently see when doctors prescribe Emacs and they haven't given us uh, a proper margin for it. We'll take a look at another case. This case actually looks pretty good. It's um, when you look at the impression and you look at the preps, the doctor's done uh, some pretty nice preparations here. Um, this came in the first time with uh, beveled margins. This is a doctor who likes doing bevels and historically has done them. And again, prescribed uh, Emacs. And so the technician called and said, we're gonna need to have those bevels removed. Um, and the bevels were removed for the most part, but there's some teeth like uh, over on the facial 
uh, of this cuspid, of tooth number 11, where we have plenty of room for a margin. But then there's other ones where it really kind of turns into a feather edge again, and it's not appropriate for Emacs. It's much more appropriate for Bruxer. So keep in mind, even though Bruxer can tolerate, you know, a feather edge margin, the ideal margin uh, for Bruxer is still a, a chamfer. And I say it's ideal because when it comes to milling it, anytime we're milling these materials in their pre-hardened state, which is what we do with Emacs, uh, and solid zirconia, there's a chance they're gonna chip. And their zirconia chips a lot less, um, but we're usually gonna have to overbuild it and then maybe hand trim it down. And we just don't like having to do that because the less you touch zirconia, um, the better. We always adjust it with water on here in the laboratory to keep from overheating it. But the point being, even though there might be a workaround and a way to deal with it, we should have especially for Emacs, a margin that looks a little more like this one on the lingual, like an actual deep chamfer, shallow shoulder. And you know, Emacs will tolerate a light chamfer, uh, but this is ideal, a heavier chamfer or a deep shoulder. Whereas this margin over, the over on the facial, on the buckle, uh, this will not be tolerated by Emacs. And even for zirconia, I mean, it'll work, but it's a little bit of a stretch and we like to have something a little deeper than that. So the best way, and I struggled with this for so many years, I, I can't even count. I mean, it, well, probably the first 13, 14 years of my career where I had this kind of issue where I couldn't really prep a tooth and have a uniform margin all the way around. You know, usually what I would do is kind of the reverse of this tooth. I'd get my deep chamfer or shoulder over here on the buckle where it was easy to get to, and then it would turn into a chamfer interproximally on the mesial and the distal, and then it would turn into a feather edge on the lingual, the surface the hardest for me to reach uh, and the hardest for me to prep correctly. So my preps used to have a deep chamfer or shoulder here, chamfers interproximally and a feather edge on the lingual. So when the lab called and said, what margin did you prep? It was like a, a compilation record or a greatest hits, a tribute to the great, all the great margins of the world on one tooth between the shoulder, the two chamfers, and the feather edge. And what really changed that for me was that reverse preparation technique that you may or may not have seen. And the one thing about that technique that makes it so easy to get ideal margins is the use of this round burr. And this is the one that I originally started using. This is an 801-021 burr. So 801's the shape, so it's a round diamond. You can see it's perfectly round. This is a diamond I had never used. Uh, before this uh, playing around with this diamond and coming up with this technique. So you can see it's a round ball on the end. And essentially what we're going to do with this is take it and put it against the tooth till half of that circle uh, is in the tooth. And so what it's gonna prep is going to be a half circle in the gingival third of the tooth. And when we do our axial reduction, we're gonna remove that top half and we're gonna have a quarter circle, which is a perfect deep chamfer or shallow shoulder, however you wanna refer to it. Um, that's, you can go on the Glidewell website and see the reverse preparation technique uh, if you haven't seen that um, before. And it shows how we use this diamond very early too. So it's the first thing we do after we break contacts and put our first uh, double zero cord in is go back in with this round burr while we still have all the hard tissue anatomy on the tooth. And it's the easiest way I've ever found to place a margin. Um, so the 801 is the shape, that means it's round, and the 021 means that it's 2.1 millimeters across that diamond. And so you really can't get it halfway, buried in halfway because of the thickness of the shank right here. But this is a diamond that we used to use when we were doing bilayered materials such as PFMs, lava crowns, um, any you know porcelain infused to alumina, anytime we needed 1.5 to 2 millimeters of reduction on the occlusal, 1 to 1.5 on the axial, and about 1 millimeter in the gingival third, we would use this. So that's an 801021. Now with the monolithic materials we're starting to use, this is an 801018. So you can see it's smaller, it's 1.8 millimeters across there. Um, I've also got an 801016 here, a slightly smaller one. And then the smallest one that they actually make is the 801014. And so I end up using the 801014 for a lot of Bruxer preparations. Uh, I end up using the 016 and the 0188 for Emacs. And I really don't use the 021 very much anymore except for when I'm doing PFMs. And by definition, the only time I do PFMs now is for bridges. I don't do single unit PFMs anymore because I'm plenty happy with lithium disilicate and solid zirconia for single unit crowns. 
But for bridges um, that are gonna be too much for solid zirconia, I still use PFM. And that's where I use this because I need the most reduction. Because at the margin of a PFM prep, I need three tenths of a millimeter for the metal. I need a tenth for the opaque, and then I need another half millimeter of porcelain for it not to fracture on a disappearing margin. And that's when I use this burr. So this one, the 018 or the 016, uh, both can work fine for Emacs. Uh, and the 014 works great for Bruxer. And so all of these, by taking these all the way around the tooth, so on a posterior tooth, this burr would literally um, come in. Of course, these teeth are, are prepped at this point, but it would prep around on the buckle and the lingual. It won't fit interproximally, but you've already gone through there with a 56 burr to create some separation. Actually, here it would go through because of the space we have between these teeth, but there it would be a little dicey. I usually don't use it interproximally, just on the facial and the lingual and it matches really well with a, a 56 burr, these two do, and a 55 burr interproximally with the two smaller ones so that the margin blends very well and then we go in with that final 856, you know, 018 burr that you'll see if you watch that reverse preparation video. So if you're thinking Emacs and you wanna prep a tooth for Emacs, the best way to ensure that you don't end up with a feather edge margin, you know, something that's more appropriate for zirconia, and the best way to ensure you don't get a phone call from the lab saying we're gonna need to switch products, is to use one of these round diamonds uh, around as much of the tooth as you can use it. And not only do you guarantee yourself um, enough gingival third reduction uh, for the material that you've chosen, such as Emacs, you end up with a nice uniform margin all the way around the tooth and that makes it much easier for the technician to see where the margin is, design the restoration, and fabricate the restoration. Thank you for that, Dr. D. Core activated, you're welcome. Oh my gosh. Now let's go to a segment we call Viewer Mail. This week's viewer mail comes to us from Michigan from Dr. Marvin Hirschvis, and he says, Hello, Dr. Dutola. I enjoy picking a pearl here and there from Terracide Magazine. I read your article on the reverse prep technique, and I agree that under prepping is a frustrating situation for labs, and it also results in poor aesthetics and color and contours. I'm curious about your editorial letter in Volume 10, Issue 1, where you point out aesthetic disappointments. You also featured a photo essay where you restored a maxillary central incisor with a compromised aesthetic Brooks or crown instead of Emacs. I was just wondering why you chose this. Ah, so you're calling me a hypocrite, good sir, are you? Good day, sir. See you out. What? I'm just kidding. I just, um, well, that's a good question. Uh, I'm glad somebody's actually paying enough attention to the magazine to, uh, to do that because it actually didn't even occur to me while writing the magazine that that was happening. And uh, it's interesting uh, when you look at the anterior crowns that doctors prescribe and send into the laboratory, if you look at the anterior crowns alone that they send in, 44% uh, of the prescriptions are for Emacs crowns. And unbelievably, 31% of the prescriptions that come in are for Bruxer. And this is a historical number over the last three years. Uh, and so this is the regular Bruxer, not the Bruxer anterior that we just recently launched about a month and a half ago. In fact, one of the interesting things is when it came time to lunch, launch Bruxer anterior and we decided how are we going to do this, we thought, you know what, we'll wait till these doctors, the 31% of doctors who are prescribing regular Bruxer in the anterior, We'll call them and let them know we have a new anterior, a much better looking version of it. And uh, we'll offer to send them that crown instead. And most of the doctors who we have called so far have said, you know what, I'm okay with the, uh, the older one, the regular one. And it's like, well, wait a minute, the new one looks so much better. And in terms of flexural strength, regular Bruxers is like 1,000 megapascals. Mm -hmm. And this one's at about 650 megapascals, so it's maybe a third weaker. Um, but Emacs, which does very well in the anterior and doesn't break, is sitting around 360 to 400 megapascals. So 650 is above that. It's not all the way to 1,000. And so kind of like Emacs, it, you know, Bruxer Anterior occupies this great space um, of straight, great combination, I should say, of strength and aesthetics. And even though we're calling doctors who have prescribed the regular less aesthetic Bruxer, and say, hey, we can switch you to this new one. It's the same cost and everything, a little weaker, but looks much better, more translucent. A lot of the doctors are saying, no, that's okay. I'll stick with the regular Bruxer. And what we've started to realize is we've kind of spoiled them with strength and they really like the strength they get from regular Bruxer. 
and they're willing to sacrifice uh, some aesthetics there. Now, the reason I chose that particular case was more to show the technique of what was being done than the actual crown itself. In fact, if I was going to do uh, that case today, I would do it with a Bruxer anterior instead of the regular Bruxer, as you pointed out. Uh, but I would also do an Emacs, and we would try both of them in and see how they look compared to each other. In fact, when we were developing Bruxer anterior, Emacs was in fact kind of our gold standard that we would put in there. And so lithium disilicate or Emacs as an anterior crown material does make a lot of sense. The fracture rate on anterior teeth is very, very low because the biting forces are about a third to half what they are in the posterior where people can really crank down. And that's where solid zirconia is probably a more logical choice, even though it's less aesthetic because it's, it's three times as strong essentially as Emacs. And so in the posterior, that makes a lot more sense. Um, with the increased translucency of the Bruxer anterior, it can get pretty close to Emacs these days. So it kind of depends. You know, if you're wanting to get, if you're leaning towards aesthetics because it's anterior teeth, you're not going to go wrong selecting Emacs crowns. But if you're somebody who uh, has had uh, anterior crowns maybe break before, or you see more wear in that patient than on your average patient, or if they've broken uh, a PFM perhaps on a bicuspid or somewhere else in the mouth, you might lean more towards Bruxer anterior than the Emax crown. So it almost doesn't matter at this point because both of them, the, the Bruxer anterior and the Emax, are more aesthetic uh, than the regular Bruxer. But the photo essay was really in there more for the technique than the material itself. But I'm glad to hear that when you read those, it set off a little alarm in your mind like, uh, hey, why is he saying this here? And then he's kind of doing something over here. Uh, part of it's because I like to do and reflect what our dentists are prescribing. And so uh, since 31% of them are prescribing for the anterior, we'll throw one of those out. But I can pretty much assure you from this point out, anytime you see Bruxer in the anterior in the magazine from this point on, it will be the Bruxer anterior, which does compare better to Emacs in terms of aesthetics than the regular one. But had that crown been an Emacs crown, that would have been a perfectly good choice for that crown as well. And since you asked that and you're the letter of the week, and since uh, uh, Megan's uh, knee deep in her meditation oh, right sorry. now, I will tell oh, you. Oh, I was I was meditating. Excuse as she me. Uh, achieves transcendence, I'll take the opportunity <laughs> to tell you that you've won a reverse preparation kit, Burr kit. Yes, the same one that we referred to in the uh, case of the week when Look we were talking that. about using the round bird to be able to prepare that. So we're going to send one of those out to you. And what do you have in terms of uh, visual aids? Well, we have these lovely photographs. This one, just my face uh, is just the picture of apathy. It I is. couldn't care less if I tried. And uh, what am I saying to you? What's the caption I don't know because I apparently did not Easy. care. Easy. Whoa, whoa, back whoa, off. Whoa. Hey, hey, hey. Or second choice, option B, we have just a beautiful photograph. Smiles, happiness. Yeah, I feel that's better of you yeah. than it is of me. But let's send him that one. Okay, That'll you want to? Good. Yep. We'll sign it we'll get and that out send with the it on. Kit. Very good. Thank you for writing in. Thanks for being the letter of the week. Megan, any news from the mm -hmm. dental world? Yes. It was 1940-something when a dentist named Dr. Joseph Stamp began making a tooth-filled concrete block at a street corner in Elkhart, Indiana. Legend has it that Stamp created it as a memorial to his childhood German Shepherd. Though none of his descendants know why he filled it with human teeth he pulled from his patients. Stamp's granddaughter says he pulled thousands of teeth as a dentist and preserved them in a barrel of chemicals in his practice's basement. Stamp passed away in 1978 at the age of 88 and is described as eccentric as all get out by the town's local history museum curator. The creepy tooth-filled rock still stands today. Wow, and um, you sent me a picture of this. I did because I needed you to see the proof that this actually exists. This actually exists. This is actually amazing. And it's funny that when they went for a quote to go ask what, you know, they, the curator of the museum thought sure. about this dentist, he said, uh, well, uh, uh, eccentric is all get yeah. out. Yeah, I mean, it's really funny that that's how they would. Right. I hope to be described that way. I think you will be. Uh, someday. If they but ask me. You look at the, is this legal? Can you put body parts in concrete on a street corner? Better question yet, why would you want to? And ex why is this like a memorial shrine to his dog? That doesn't make any sense. I can see if they were all canine teeth. <laughs> hey now. Wow, it hurts. It's yeah. so painful. Mm. Um, that was punny. But mm. I, honestly, like I, you've heard me talk about Parker, the perfect puppy. I love my dog, but I'm not... You know, I don't have access to thousands of human teeth, but if I did, I, I don't think that that would be my um, 
creative outlet. Well, you do have access to thousands of crowns here at the lab. That right. would make more sense, right? Crowns that came back from dentists because they didn't fit, put it together all in one blob, but actual human teeth. We have a need in the R&D department for a lot of these teeth. I wish we had. It's getting harder and harder to get extracted teeth. When I was in dental school, it was much easier. Everybody just saved them all in a mayonnaise jar, but now there's so many students who need them, it's hard to get these. Really? I'd like to buy this on eBay That's and ship disgusting. it out. That's disgusting. You think so? Yes. Why extracted teeth are awesome. No, they're not awesome. They're gross. They're it's really the not. same if thing. We've had stories on this show about um, people making jewelry out of teeth. Right. Um, ew. My my. It still remains. My opinion remains the same. That is gross. I'd say surgically removed polyps are gross. For example, or maybe an appendix, or dare I say, a placenta. A recent why? memory. And why? Why do you have to crunch your teeth like that so hard? Um, if you guys could hear on set, he closes his mouth and you, the That's building to shakes. You, but. Yeah, um, so yeah, that does seem eccentric as all uh, get, get out, out. and I'm, I'm surprised they're allowing it to be there, but uh, well, good for him. Everybody needs a hobby. Okay. <laughs> Anything else? Yes. It's not very often that you would hear the words relaxing and dentist in the same sentence, but a Tokyo dentist might change that. Pure Cure is a dental salon that offers a variety of services, such as facials and manicures, as well as dentistry. He is known as the butler dentist because his uniform is a suit. He just started offering a new quick brushing service. For roughly 13 US dollars, you can have the butler brush your teeth while you rest your head on his lap. <laughs> I'm re- sorry. The re- fact that there is an audience for this, that there is a demand for this, is disturbing. <laughs> what? So let me get this straight. Yes. He, he's there in a suit, and instead of a dental chair, the patient lays their head in his lap and he brushes their teeth. Yeah. It oh, just wow. poses so many, just oh, I, so many questions. That I'm trying I have. to decide which end of that I'd like to be on, the brusher or the brushy. But here's the thing: this is not the twice a year cleaning. This isn't a hygiene appointment. This is honest to goodness. This man is brushing your teeth for you for one of your two times for the day. So you go well. Well, thirteen dollars is expensive for that. Maybe is it more like a gum massage where somebody goes once a week because no, you, you're holding a lot of tension in your gums and here's a massage. He is wearing a dapper suit mm-hmm. and you go in there and pay him thirteen dollars and lay your head on his lap, look up into his creepy eyes. I'm sorry, his eyes, and he brushes your teeth. You're looking at his nose hair. If you're if your head does he wear a mask? I, I don't know. I hope. Did you see a picture of this? I did. It was. Disturbing. Is the patient laying crosswise or the lengthwise? They didn't. They didn't have a picture of a patient in his lap they just had a picture of this dentist dressed in like he was going to cinderella's ball oh interesting yeah huh. very 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 interesting but i don't know if that's legal in this country I or this state i doubt it i think you need some barrier like a dental chair right there before but you do it it's just like i think that don't you grow out of having people brush your teeth once you know you can do it yourself yeah typically at the age of say six right. <laughs> yeah that's usually when you grow out of it so right I don't know. That sounds to me like an interest. I don't know if it's a kind of a fetish thing to have somebody brush your teeth or if it, what it represents for them, but um, that's, that's kind of weird. Um, I think kind of is being rather conservative. Right. Well, it didn't happen in Germany or Florida, so Shocking. I'm, I'm surprised that mm-hmm. it wasn't one of those two places. Well, thank you, Megan. That about wraps it up for this episode. On behalf of myself, the CSL crew, Megan, and everybody here at the lab, I want to thank you for your time and your continued commitment to quality dentistry. We'll see you next time. And in this week's viewer mail, a dentist writes in and wants to know why in the last issue of the magazine, I complained about crown aesthetics in the front and then showed a l- uh, less than aesthetic. This week's viewer mail comes from Sorry. So you could do the last thing. Your mind, like, uh, hey, why is he saying this here? And then he's kind of doing something over here. Uh, part of it's because I like to do and reflect what our dentists are prescribing. And so, uh, since 31% of them are prescribing Brugge for the Extracted teeth are awesome.